Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, my name is Jarvis. Theodore Jarvis. Hey, Jarvis. Yes, I'm the local representative for Greater Southwest Insurance Company here in Las Vegas. Oh, yes, that fabulous town of the fast buck. I beg your pardon? And I think of all the money I have won and lost over the gaming tables in that town of yours. I know what you mean. Tell me, how's the weather there in Connecticut? The weather? Yes. Well, cold is a... Uh, why do you want to know about the weather? Well, it's so nice and warm and comfortable here. It'd be a nice change for you, wouldn't it? Well, of course it would. I hate this cold weather. But unless you have some insurance matter that you want me to investigate... It's a matter of the utmost importance, Dollar. Can you fly out here right away? Sure, why not? Good. On, uh... One condition. What's that? That you'll guarantee me the time and a chance to drop a fishing line in Lake Mead or uh, over in Lake Mojave. Dollar, that's exactly what I want you to do. You want me out there to go fishing? To go fishing, among other things. Yeah, like what other things? Mainly just to go fishing. Oh, sure. With a very beautiful and a very charming young lady. Is that so? Who also happens to be very, very wealthy. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, Jarvis, you make this sound more attractive every... Now, wait a minute. Is this some kind of a gag? I'm absolutely serious. Well? On expense account? Practically unlimited. Well, that does it, Jarvis. I'm on my way. CBS Radio brings you Bob Reddick in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Greater Southwest Insurance Company, Las Vegas office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the very fishy matter. Yeah, there was something very fishy about this being called all the way out there just to go fishing. There had to be. But after all, it would give me a chance to get away from the freezing weather here in Hartford. And who knows? Maybe I would have a chance to wet a line in Lake Mead or Mojave. So item one on the expense account is $170.40 for a nighttime flight to Los Angeles. Item two is $21.10 for the plane that dropped me off in Vegas shortly after breakfast the next morning. Item three, $4 even for a cab into the office of Theodore Jarvis on Fremont Street. Ted was in his mid-thirties, but a mite too serious about his job. You want to talk about it right here in the office, Dollar? Well, why not? Let's face it, Ted, it's one of the few places in town that doesn't have a slot machine or a craps table or roulette or blackjack. I guess the business offices and the churches are just about the only places where one can't gamble. Fortunes are won and lost every day here in Las Vegas, Dollar. Yes, I can believe that. Which is one of the reasons you're here. Oh, I thought it was to go fishing. It is. Because of the Birdwell fortune... I should say because of Miss Lisa Birdwell's fortune. Is that the young, attractive, charming... Yes, that's the girl I told you about over the phone. You'll love her, Dollar. Better than fishing? I beg your pardon? Well, first you dragged me out here on the promise of some good fishing. Exactly. Now it sounds as though you want to throw me into the arms of some doll. Both. I don't get you. I said both. She is a doll, and I want you to go fishing with her. Where? On Lake Mojave, about 90 miles south of here. Great. Oh, you're familiar with it? Oh, I know it like the back of my hand. Ted, I can take you to more good spots to pull in lunker bass on that lake. Excellent. Only, um, stop being so vague. Tell me what this is all about. Lisa Birdwell. Lisa Birdwell. Mm Mm-hmm. Until a few months ago, she was a school teacher up in Salt Lake City. A school teacher? That's right. And living and working among the good people of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's the Mormon church. Yes, I know. Go on, Ted. Well, she was very much interested. Seriously considered joining that church. Devoting her life to the kind of service they stand for. That is, until her father died and left her some money. How much? You see, Lisa was his only blood relation. How much, Ted? Oh, ten or twelve thousand dollars. Ten or twelve, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, I thought you said she was rich. I thought... All right, all right. Go ahead. Being free from family ties for the first time in her life, being young and beautiful, she decided to take some time off and have herself a little fling. On $10,000? Yes. Until. 
Until what? Until, in the course of her travels, she happened to land here in Vegas, where suddenly one night she discovered what a roulette wheel is for. Uh Oh, knowing nothing whatsoever about the game, she calmly proceeded to run up one of the biggest scores on record. She what? She walked out of that casino with something over $400,000. No kidding. And, incidentally, that is the last time she ever gambled. A smart girl. Mm-hmm. Instead, she bought herself a little ranch out near the edge of town and took her foster brother, that's her only living relative, his name is uh, Tony Birdwell, Yeah. took him along to sort of manage the place. And now, well, she's just making the most of life, enjoying it to the fullest. Who wouldn't? When she isn't taking in the winter sports at the Charleston Mountains, some 35 miles northwest of here, she's fishing Lake Mead or Mojave in her yacht. Yacht on one of those lakes? Prettiest 52-footer you ever saw. Right now, she has it down on Lake Mojave. Well, beautiful yacht, beautiful girl, lots of money. Let's go fishing. Exactly. But uh, why? I mean, from your standpoint. Because of that foster brother. Because if anything happens to her, he'll get everything she has. Her money, the ranch, and some 120000 of insurance. Are you trying to say you think he'd kill her for it? He himself? Never. He's not man enough. Well, then what? But have somebody else do it for him? Yes. Okay. Who? That's what I hope you can find out for us, Johnny. Before it's too late. That's why you've got to get down to Lake Mojave right away. Why? Because Tony has already arranged for Lisa to be murdered. Radio Free Europe is still on the job, broadcasting the truth about world events through the Iron Curtain. What keeps the truth going through the Iron Curtain? Not communist altruism. No, your truth dollars to keep men's minds free, no matter where they are. As the communist pressure around the world increases, telling the truth about what they are up to is more vital than ever. Support the Radio Free Europe Fund, Box 1961, Mount Vernon 10, New York. That's Radio Free Europe Fund, Box 1961, Mount Vernon 10, New York. Tell me, what makes you think that this brother, this foster brother Tony, has arranged to have Lisa murdered? Think? I'm sure of it. Why? Because of one of those things that can happen only once in a million times, Johnny. Go on. Last night, I tried to call Lisa at the ranch. The phone out there was in use, but instead of getting a busy signal, I could hear this voice, Tony's voice on that phone. He was saying... Okay, okay, just shut up and let me talk. Lisa's on her way down to the lake now, to Lake Mojave Resort. She plans to stay out on the boat several days with some friends, she told me. So you'll be along. You'll be one of them. But you don't get the ten grand until she's dead. So just make sure you do it right. I see. And you're sure it was Tony's voice, Ted? Yes. Could you recognize the voice of whoever he was talking to? Well, that's where I goofed, Johnny. I'm afraid I kind of gasped or something. And he must have heard me because he hung up. Mm Mm-hmm. Fishing with some friends down there. Including whoever he was talking to. Yes. In other words... One of the people aboard that boat with her is there to kill her. That's right. Well, have you any idea? Right after I called you in Hartford, I called the Lake Mojave Resort and I talked to her. You warned her not to go out? Oh, well, she'd only have poo-pooed that idea, but I did ask her who'd be going along with her. Today? Yes. Who? Well, as usual, a real mixed crowd. And I've checked on all of them. Who, Ted? Jim Faree... A dealer at one of the casinos here in town. Marie? Yes, he's a drifter. Not too good a reputation. And? A girl named Sadie Reese. She's a... Well, I'll call her a B girl. That's putting it kindly. For one of the questionable saloons in town. And? A Miss Clara Hinckley. A visiting school teacher that Lisa picked up somewhere. A school teacher on vacation at this time of year and here in Vegas? I wondered about that, too. Then there's Charles Schroeder. He's an elder in the Mormon church. An old friend from Salt Lake City. I think she met him here in town. And? Paul Holder. 
Now, who is he? He's the nice young kid who runs the boat for her. The rest of the time, he acts as a kind of a handyman at the ranch. Paul Holder. Yes. Pretty well mixed up crowd. Then she always puts her parties together that way. Who else, Ted? That's all. But one of them is there to kill her. So the sooner you get down there, Johnny... Ted, I'm on my way. Item four, the usual 50 bucks deposit on a rental car. I burned up Highway 95 through Henderson, Boulder City, and Searchlight, and then cut east on 77 to Davis Dam. There I turned north for three miles to Lake Mojave Resort. My old friend, Ham Pratt, general manager of the resort, was in his office down over the dock. And as always, when I told him what my job was, Ham offered 1,000% cooperation. Yeah, Johnny, at least Bert Wellner and her party took off only a couple of hours ago. And with enough groceries aboard that big cruiser to keep them for a week. Now, how will I spot that boat out there on the lake, Ham? Lisa, you can't miss it. It's beauty. All 52 feet of it. No other cruiser that big on the lake. And she uses that for fishing? And for living on when she's here, she and her friends. Any idea where she might have headed? Probably up toward the big basin, 10, 12 miles up. Okay, then. And she always does a lot of fishing in the, uh, the big coves on this side of the lake, below the basin. All right, then, that's where... Now, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, Johnny? Are those people with her? Yeah. There's Jim Faree and Sadie Reese. You can have them both for my money. A Miss Clara Hinckley. Well, she's a school teacher, like Lisa used to be. Yes, I know. And a Charles Schroeder. I understand he's an elder in the Mormon church. And they are all with her. Yeah. When did they get here, Ham? Bill came last night, shortly after she did. And who of them got here last? Well, as far as I know, they all came about the same time after dinner. Well, and that's no help. Except for Paul, of course. Paul Holder. Yeah, he's the nice kid that works on her ranch, comes down here to run the boat for her. Yeah, so I understand. I didn't see him arrive, so uh, must have been well after midnight. I see. Okay, Ham, I'll need a boat. Well, I got one tied up to the dock with a 40-horse motor on it you can use. Also a flock of fishing tackle. Have my outfit. Welcome to it. And I need a nice string of fish. Oh? Yes. Well, that's easy. Is it? Your pal Buster Favor has a has a bunch of lunkers in the live box tied up under the dock. Then let's go. Getting aboard the Lisa to meet Lisa and her so-called fishing pals was a cinch. In the outboard that Ham had provided, plus tackle and a stringer full of Nice big largemouth bass. I simply headed up the lake until I saw the cruiser anchored in Telegraph Cove. And then, making my outboard miss a few times by cutting the switch, I hove to alongside. What's the matter, mister? Having trouble? Well, it sounds like I've run out of gas. It sure does. Paul, huh? Oh, hello there. Hi. Yeah, looks like he's run out of gas, Lisa. Well, may I come aboard and borrow some from you? Well, yes, you certainly can. And you can stay as long as you like. Well, thanks. What did you do that for, Lisa? Don't you see, Paul? Just look at that string of fish. Oh, you're right. If you can show us how to get fish like that, you can stay with us just as long as you like. Well, sure. Why not? Good. Just tie up a stern and climb aboard. And I want you to meet all my friends. Okay? Fine. I'd like nothing better. <laughs> They'll be making music again on Arthur Godfrey time tomorrow. The they in question are the fabulous Kirby Stone Four, keeping the air full of songs beginning tomorrow on Arthur's show. Dick Hyman's The Man with a Band. And for ditties from the distaff side, there's velvet-voiced Miss King Ling. Whenever the high-spirited Kirby Stone Four show up, you can be sure of plenty of far-out funny business as well as a sparkling sprinkling of songs. Join CBS Radio's Arthur Godfrey time tomorrow. I spent the rest of the day there aboard Lisa's cruiser, telling Paul Holder where to anchor over some of my pet fishing spots. Luckily, they all paid off. And Lisa, even prettier and more charming than I thought, insisted that I stick around as long as they stayed on the lake. Good. This gave me the chance I wanted to see and talk to every one of her party. 
if possible, to pick out the person aboard who was there to kill her. And what a motley crew. Suppose I give you a rundown on them. Well, first, there was Paul Holder, the ranch hand skipper, a small, thin fellow in his early 20s with a freckled face and a friendly smile. Almost too friendly? No, well, maybe I was misjudging him. Maybe. But there was Jim Faree, the gambler, tall, dark, suave, and good-looking. And I had no doubt that he'd do exactly what he said he'd do. <laughs> sure, Johnny. I'd kill my own mother for a prize. Do you think I'm kidding? <laughs> As for Sadie Reese, well, what a cheap dame like this was doing aboard a yacht. Oh, I said, sure, Lisa. As long as my good-looking friend Jim here is along. Bait up my hook for me, will you, Jimmy? Old Clara Hinckley, the retired school teacher who fished alone because nobody could stand her shrill and dull and constant yakety yak. I'll never forget the time we had the second grade picnic. It was May. Or maybe it was June, I guess. Anyway, it rained. And on and on and on about the dear, darling second graders to whom she taught reading, writing, and arithmetic. And finally, Charles Schroeder, who didn't fish, but spent most of his time with Lisa, talking earnestly with her, occasionally reading a passage from the Book of Mormon that he carried with him. I set down my rod and joined them. Read it, study it, believe in it, my dear. And I'm certain, as certain as I am of the great hereafter. But Johnny, no more fishing for you? Well, I'm afraid I just about had my limit when I came aboard. Oh. As I started to say, oh, No Lisa, more now, Charles, please. As you wish, my dear. My, I'm glad we found you stuck in that cove, Johnny. Well, so am I, Lisa. You've brought us wonderful fishing luck. Look at all that I've caught. You're an excellent guide, my boy. Thanks, Charles. Anybody like a cigarette? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. And uh, here. Mason. Mm -hmm. Charles. Thanks. But now, if you two will excuse me. Sure. Johnny, there's another reason why I'm glad you came aboard. Oh? It's... Well, it's the reason I put you in the cabin next to mine. Well, uh, now, Lisa... Because... Well, because I've had the most uneasy feeling all day. Have you? I don't really know how to describe it, but... Well... Yeah? Johnny, I'm afraid. But I don't know what of. Kind of look after me. Hmm? Sure. Good. Now, I'm going down to the galley and cook us all the biggest fish dinner you ever saw. All right? Uh, Lisa... Yes? Johnny? Nothing. Go ahead, I'm starved. By the time dinner was over, it was late. We were tired, so we all went to our respective cabins and hit the sack. Except for me. After waiting a while for things to quiet down, I tapped on Lisa's door. And without really telling her why, I made her switch cabins with me. In her bunk, then, I put a dummy. And then quietly took a blanket up on deck. Laid it out by the anchor hatch up forward and waited. But I had overestimated my ability to stay awake, and I slept like a log. But not for long. What? And by rolling over, I'd caught the darn blanket on a cleat. By the time I could tear it loose and then get on down below, they were all gathered in front of Lisa's cabin. Look! Look, somebody come in here and shot her. Somebody killed her. Did they say they... Lisa, you're okay. Lisa. But look. Well, that's a dummy in your bunk. That's right. Lisa, my dear. Thank heaven you're all right. Yes, Charles. Yeah, but who did this? Who did it? That's a good question, Paul. I tell you this, we'll never get him. Him? What? He stole your boat, Johnny. Took off in that boat of yours. Well, how could he, Jim? It was out of gas. Only it wasn't, Paul. What do you mean? I only used that as an excuse to get on board. What? I don't understand. Paul, make us a pot of coffee. And we'll all sit down and talk this over. In other words, my real reason for coming on board this boat was to protect Lisa from what almost happened. I see. A uh, private eye. Huh? An insurance investigator, Jim, looking out for a client. More coffee, Sadie? Sure, baby. 
I mean, Johnny. Yeah, I can use some more of that, too. Paul, maybe you better make some more. It's already on, Lisa. Charles? Uh, thank you, yes. All right. Now, this murder was attempted by one of us here in this cabin. Why? What? By the one complete phony among us. But your boat was stalled. No, no, Jim. It was cut loose by somebody in this cabin to throw the rest of us off the track. Maybe. Did you hear the motor on it? Well, no. All right, then. Now, Jim, it's obvious, I think, that you're what you say you are, a gambler with a fast eye for a buck. And you probably have a record, don't you? So what? Now, had this murder been gotten away with, you'd be the number one suspect, wouldn't you? And now you look and here... And, well, there's nothing phony about you. Now, what do you mean by that, Johnny? Well, let's not go into that. Uh, Miss Hinckley? Well, certainly we can eliminate you. <laughs> really, Mr. Dollar? As for you, Paul... Oh, now, you look here, Johnny. Just keep your shirt on. Yeah, but if you're trying to say... That... All I said was there's a phony among us. And there he is. What do you mean? Are you looking at me, young man? Johnny. Why not, Charles? After all, you're it. You don't know what you're talking about. Shall I prove it? You have proof? All I need. I see. Stand back there, all of you. Oh, no. oh, God. Oh, no. And is that the gun you used on that dummy thinking it was Lisa? Yes. Yes, and it's reloaded. There's a bullet for every one of you. I see. More coffee, Charles? Oh, no, no. What did I do, mister? Oh, Paul. Oh, sorry, I broke that pitcher on. Nice That's work, Paul. Johnny, how did you know? An elder of the Mormon church, huh? And he accepted and smoked a cigarette out there on the deck this afternoon? Why, yes, he did. But Mormons don't smoke. That's right. And they don't drink coffee. They don't take a stimulant of any kind. So now, if we can get him to talk, rather than have us toss him overboard, shall we bring him to and try it? He talked all right. Plenty. And of course, he implicated Lisa's foster brother, Tony. So now it's all up to the courts. Expense account total, including a couple of days of good fishing with Ham Pratt and then the trip home, $245.50. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, well, believe it or not, I go to jail. Fact. And I don't mean just to pay someone a little call. No, I get thrown into the clink, and for what, I have to admit, is plenty good reason. And then, believe this or not, I engineer a highly unsuccessful jailbreak, which means in the end that luck was with me. Because if the break had succeeded, I wouldn't be around to tell you about it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Starring Bob Reddick is written by Jack Johnstone. Produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Heard in our cast were Mandel Kramer as Ted, Terry Keene as Lisa, Jim Bowles as Ham, Danny Ako as Charles, Bill Mason as Paul, Joan Loring as Sadie, and Robert Dryden as Jim. Be sure to join us next week same time and station for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hanna speaking. France in Focus. David Schoenbrunn's Your Man in Paris weekdays on the CBS radio network.